Okay. You know, I'm not interrupt this our key witness. Twelve minutes of peace, and then we'll ask each other questions. That's great. Okay. For the audience, for the audience. Then we have another big panel. It's being moderated by Mr. Hill. Yeah, thank you very much. This is a panel on uh, consent decrees, and I just want to introduce this uh, topic a little bit. Uh, when I came to the Justice Department in, in the late 80s, there were three things that we learned uh, immediately. One is that we were an enforcement agency, not a, a regulatory agency, with the implication being that we were doing God's work and that the regulatory agencies were doing the opposite. And uh, the second thing we learned is that um, structural remedies are better than behavioral remedies for whatever reason. And the third thing we, we all learned was to buy uh, shares in AT&T so we didn't have to work on the, uh, the modified final judgment. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what everybody did except for, uh, except for Tim Brennan and a couple of colleagues of mine who actually worked on this. So, so the, these, issues, these issues don't go away. The, we, we heard yesterday, you know, more things change, more things remain the same. And, and to, as, to illustrate this, I, I pulled up this, uh, I don't know how I found this. This is a letter from uh, Bill Baxter to David Stockman c complaining about Commerce Secretary Baldridge's speech or, or testimony to be given on the Telecommunications De Deregulation Act of 1981, which apparently asked for uh, a Chinese wall between the, the long distance and local divisions of AT&T, some kind of behavioral remedy that would, would prevent the two, uh, two sides from talking to each Why other. Structural? Uh, I don't know, behavioral, whatever. It, right? It's quasi-structural. Yeah. Quasi-behavioral. And, and just, to, just to show you kind of how these issues don't go away, just re recently, the, uh, the, a couple of years ago, the FTC uh, brought a consummated hospital merger against uh, Evanston uh, Hospital, and and, and uh, the, as the relief that they're asking for, the the invited relief, they they want to put a Chinese wall between the two hospitals, so they so they bargain separately with the insurance companies, and the staff issued a, a scathing um, scathing uh, assessment of that, but very similar to uh, Baxter's. Baxter's criticism of uh, Baldridge's uh, testimony. But anyway, without, without further ado, these, these panels, panelists need no introduction. They're not going to get any. So, uh, <laughs> so and we're going we're gonna to hold them to 12 minutes so that, so that we have time for questions from the audience because these are all, always a lot of controversial issues. So without further ado. Thank you. Um, hi. Uh, I'm happy to, on my job, I've been told that around 8.58 was to give sort of a general overview and introduction with respect to consent decrees without interjecting my own personal opinions into the subject, <laughs> which of course I won't do quite. But anyhow, I did have this pleasure of writing this little book called Antitrust Consent Decrees. I hope some of you will actually read it at some particular point, um, which does go over some, oh, <laughs> which tries to get score points. Uh, yeah, yes, he did. How did you get it so quickly? Um, um, which, which does go over the history of many of these decrees, including a fairly uh, detailed account of some of what happens with respect to the uh, Bell uh, system breakup that had been ordered, of course, in 1982, with all of the aftermath that followed. This was one of many consent decrees that has been entered into, and the question in many cases is to figure out where this works well. And, and for the most part, the conclusion that I would come up with with respect to consent decrees can be summarized in a simple, single problem. If there's an antitrust violation that you can understand and define, the appropriate response is to fix the antitrust violation and to go on and to do something else. And that the question is not so much the sort of fuzzy line between behavioral and structural remedies, which I still don't fully understand. The way in which I would call it is a goodness of fit and a tightness question between the wrong that's been identified on the one hand and the corrections that are going to be imposed on the other. And, and this is something which goes back a very, very long time. And so one of the first cases has to do with the Packers. And the question is, when you find out that Swift and Armour and all those folks are fixing prices and reducing quantities, what do you start to do? And well, one of the things that you could say is that you're not allowed to join together to fix quantities or to set prices and leave it at that. But when they actually had this consent decree, which was entered into a day after the suit was filed, so this whole thing was prearranged and jury rigged, 
What they did is they introduced all sorts of other prohibitions, including those which says you can't enter into certain kinds of collateral lines of business without our approval. And surely enough, what you saw in those early cases was an antitrust decree of that sufficient breadth, which had exactly the opposite intentions of what the antitrust laws should do. It became a weapon to make sure that these guys could not be competitive in the grocery market because of the way in which they were fixing prices in the meat market. And so when they tried to modify the decree some years after, the persons who exposed the expansion were, of course, those grocers who did not want to face the contribution from these various sorts of integrated producers. And 30 years later, when one of these companies tried to acquire a, a bus line, again, you had a very long decision under the consent decree to see whether or not this particular activity was permissible, even though it was wholly unrelated to anything that was associated with the wrong. So I think that that's one lesson that we never want to forget in this particular area. It clearly applies in many cases to the AT&T case. It's one of the things that when you start looking at it that always amazes you is that virtually nothing that was written in that very long, thoughtful, and exhaustive opinion uh, by Judge Green had anything to do with the underlying nature of the violations of the antitrust laws in question. Um, the major objection that they had on a particular substantive ground had to do with some technical point of relay. And there was an MCI connection that was going to go from St. Louis to Chicago and on to Washington. And AT&T said, we do not have to carry your connection from Chicago to Washington unless you have a switching office in Chicago as well as in St. Louis. And since you don't have that, we're just going to exclude you. And this was thought to be a situation dealing with monopolization by by exclusive dealing or whatever it is, tie-ins, you call it whatever you want. And sure enough, for this reason, you break up the entire company. I mean, you start trying to figure out whether or not that kind of structural remedy should be dealing with this question. And I think the appropriate answer in a case like that, if you're serious about the antitrust side of this particular issue, is to take a much more modest position on the subject and to say what happens is if there's certain carriage obligations that we think ought to be imposed upon somebody as part of an integrated network, then what you do is impose these carriage obligations upon them and leave the largest structural changes for somebody else. So that's the first lesson I think that one wants to learn about this. Um, the second lesson I think that one wants to learn about all of these things as, a, as an institutional matter is a, <clears throat> takes a somewhat different view, and, and that's the danger of false optimism and what you can achieve by virtue of a consent decree or anything else. And let me give a couple of examples of how this works. Um, and this is not confined to consent decrees. It could also happen with legislation or lots of other things. Um, essentially what happens is there is a part of the economy to which the widget model works and you can understand something that looks like or approaches pure competition. And that's maybe 80% of the economy, which means that intellectually when we start talking about consent decrees and trying to organize businesses, what we're worried about is the other 20% of the economy for which these kinds of solutions don't work. And it's you know, part of the standard law of regulation and everything else in the world, like taking care of bad kids at school, which is 80 to 90% of your problems happen with 10 to 20% of the people or the industries that you're working with. And of course, network industries are a classic illustration where it's very difficult to maintain some degree of a competitive equilibrium. And I don't know the answer to the question of whether or not you want to follow the old Bell model. Um, and you remember what they said back in the 1970s, that the system was the solution, right? Um, sort of everything was comprehensive, all internalized, we regulate everything and so forth. Whether you want to have a system of forced interconnect interconnections where you have to regulate the interconnection stuff, whether you want to have a buying and selling of unbundled networks or whatever it turns out to be later on. But whatever it is, the thought that somehow or other you could take an industry which is heavily regulated under one kind of configuration and convert this thing into a series of freestanding competitors who will behave as though they were in a competitive industry will not work for the simple reason that you cannot operate your business unless you can connect up to somebody else's business. And the fragmentation and separation, which makes um, different serial companies work very, very well, makes all these networks completely useless. And one of the things that was, of course, so clear about what happened in these decrees is that people started to talk about this stuff as if somehow or other you could usher in an age, a utopian age that was nowhere attainable and by simple inspection of the way in which the system operates could not be obtainable. So you then start getting false expectations, and whenever you get false expectations, what happens, unfortunately, under the circumstances is that you will be disappointed when these false expectations are never going to be realized. 
And what one sees in effect with respect to the AT&T decree is that we did not have there uh, a way to return to a competitive industry. The moment you put that stuff into place, of course, the degree of regulation of anything was probably more intensive than it was before because you had three moving parts instead of two. Now that Judge Green was constantly in on the show along with the local carriers and everybody else, and as everybody who's ever worked in this area knows, the numbing detail and the really sort of I had to knock them down, scorched earth kinds of policies that were associated with adjudication before him absolutely took place. So, you know, and you've got to expect that. The second thing, of course, is that he guessed wrong, as did Bill Baxter. I mean, what Baxter was doing was engaging in infantile industrial policy in which he somehow or the thought that, what? Go ahead. That he thought that, you know, if you, you have all these local exchange carriers with their local monopolies, you get the right sort of insulation, you get this competition in the long distance market, that you could forge the connections going down and going across in just the right fashion so that it would look more competitive and better regulated than before. And that funny little diagram that was on, that, that clip which was put on the board in which AT&T starts and then ends with AT&T, it's not quite right because the second diagram has got to have AT&T, it's got to have Verizon, maybe has to have Sprint to somebody else, T-Mobile sitting on some other side. But the key point to understand is that by the time this industry sorts itself out 20 years later, uh, what you see is that the, all these firms are vertically integrated with local and, and sort of sort of um, long distance carry, the cell phones start to come in, which nobody had anticipated. In fact, just as, in reference to some of the things that were said yesterday, as late as 1996 when the merger took place and I did some work for Verizon, uh, the widespread expectation was that cell phones would never be on parity with landlines and all the protections of landlines were sort of going up like this and the cell phone market was thought to sputter around and the main question of course with cell phones is that they were so expensive that you turned them off unless you wanted to make a phone call which created all sorts of imbalances with respect to bill and keep and so forth. Now you look at the market with all these geniuses, myself included, predicted in 1996, and you see is that cell phones lastly outlined um, landlines, and as a sort of symbolic Epstein family act, what we did about six months ago, my wife says, why do we have a second landline when everybody has a phone? And she called up the company and canceled the thing and reduced the Epstein household by 50%, while our cell phone thing went up, I don't know how many fam family phones there are. But what? Why do you keep one? Well, we, we keep one, well, no, we have, never mind. I, I, I don't have to justify it to you. Um, we kept them. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, you know, I'm atavistic. We like a landline. It's an insurance company. But, but I mean, you see, you get all that industrial policy out there, and it's extremely dangerous. Now, in the Microsoft case, of course, there is also, I think, some of that as well. And my basic view about this decree is you've got this company which had one huge hit and is constantly struggling to find itself. And when you get all these guys peering over their shoulders, looking at this and that, and you allow everybody to come on in there and say, well, maybe they're not doing this with the right competitive motion. All you're doing is slowing them down a little bit, and I'm worried about them becoming the Ottoman Empire, the Turkey of the 21st century, or whatever it is. And you know, I just want to end all of these kinds of decrees and get on with business. I think all the fancy monopolization arguments aren't very strong. My last point, which I will make, is the question of how firms ought to respond to this. United Shoe, I think, is a very nice illustration of some of this stuff. Um, also, some of the Visa credit card cases show the same kinds of situation. Lots of times when people attract, attach, say in the United Shoe case, various kinds of contracting terms that are included in your leases, all the exclusivity, the replacements, the sharing, whatever it is, you look at these things and solemnly somebody says, these things are really making a huge difference in the marketplace. They're always wrong. Uh, what happens is you have the 1922 decree and United Shoe gets rid of this, its market share remains unconstant. You do the same thing in 1947, more terms come, exactly the same thing, nothing happens to market share. You do it in 1953, you get rid of some more terms, same thing happens. It turned out that what Louis Brandeis, by the way, who was the guy who, I did not know this at the time, who engineered the United Shoe deal. He was the private lawyer in Boston who put this thing together. He understood that this was a super double marginalization problem when you had all of these vertical technologies on top of one another fighting with each other. And what happened is essentially everybody preferred the efficiency. And so what happens is when you sit there and then fight to defend endlessly the terms against invalidation, they start to take on a life of their own. They really don't matter that very much. Just get rid of the things and go on with your business instead of fighting them all the time. And the same thing was true with my 
Microsoft and all of its effort to try to get you know everybody's browsers in a bad position. People like integrated suppliers. They want thin chains. They want to talk to one guy. There are a lot of transactional efficiencies that are taking place. Um, Visa and Microsoft. MasterCard had these arrangements with sophisticated tie-ins who say, you want this card or that card, I'm going to end on this note, you got to take all our cards, they pay three billion dollars, they separate the two and they lose 12 customers. I mean, you do have to understand in all of this stuff, is essentially the monopolization things don't mean much and that the maxim is, if somebody has a structural objection to the way your contracts are written, probably it doesn't matter. You get rid of it, you'll see how weak the causal connection is. If you keep it, people will start to assume that the entire business is propped up by a set of terms which frankly aren't worth the powder to blow them to hell. And on that note, I shall be silent. So, oh my God. Thank, you, thank you, Richard. So now we're going to hear, uh, there's one more maxim I, I forgot to, to tell you about that I learned at the Justice Department, and, and that is if there is no solution, there is no problem. <laughs> and uh, so now we're going to hear from Bob. It's an insoluble problem. Uh, following, following Richard is really a, is really a task. Um, oh, okay. all right, okay. Um, they, they work. I thought maybe they weren't working. Um, it's, it's a problem. It's like sitting in 1784 and trying to write a cadenza for one of uh, Mozart's uh, uh, piano concerti, and he's in the same room, and he just wrote another concerto while you were just writing a cadenza. Uh, you know, I mean, it's... Why you can't miss me, right? <laughs> so anyway... Um, uh, I brought I brought this I mean obviously I brought this book just to bootlick Richard but but if you look through the book um, my my approach to antitrust is a little different from Richard's and understandably we we have different uh, uh, relative interests and skills uh, if you look at this book the only numbers in here are the page numbers uh, there is no <laughs> there, there, <laughs> There's no estimates of, of, of how any of these things worked out. Now, now, Richard, I, I agree with, with most of what I've, I've I read it quickly. Of most of what's in there, um, uh, namely that the, the decrees ought to be simple. They ought to address the, the ills that were that were found at trial, the antitrust violations. But the question of whether these antitrust violations amount to a hill of beans or not uh, has to be in the uh, in the pudding about when you when you attack them, when you get the relief. Does it really make any difference in terms of market performance? And um, many years ago, but just before the Microsoft, supposed Microsoft hearing on relief, I was supposed to, I did some work for Microsoft looking back at all of the old Section 2 decrees to see, uh, find any, uh, any and all I could to, to, to analyze as to their effect. And we went through, uh, let's see, there were something like 336 civil decrees, uh, civil uh, cases in which the government either won or, or, or entered a consent decree, uh, settling it in their favor. Uh, of these, I think I looked at a total of maybe 15 to 19 of them in two separate articles, uh, one by myself, one with Ken Elzinga. And I could find none of these uh, decrees having any salutary effect on economic welfare, consumer welfare, except one. And that would be the AT&T case. Um, and we'll come to that in a second. Later, Cliff Winston and I did a little more exhaustive search for trying to see what evidence is there in the applied economics literature of the effects of the rest of the antitrust laws. And we couldn't find much. And we, pu we published something in the Journal of Economic Perspective saying there's no empirical evidence after a mere uh, 113 years of antitrust in the United States, uh, statutory antitrust. Um, uh, of a uh, salutary effect of antitrust policy. That isn't to say that, that there hasn't been any, it's just that economists certainly haven't studied it. You'd think that we would want to study this and look at it and see whether what makes sense, what doesn't make sense in terms of the ultimate effect on how markets perform. Now, the response to that for most of my colleagues in the profession was, how could I say such things? Don't I realize that antitrust is important? I said, well, Give me some evidence. Uh, and th I have not seen any evidence since then. But the most serious, it, it's obviously hard to do this analysis. And the most serious argument they make uh, about the effects of antitrust is that you can't tell from the individual cases, but you can only tell from deterrence. Now, uh, I don't know how you're going to study the effects of uh, these various cases on deterrence. Uh, let me give you one example. I mean, sur surely that's the way you might want to study price fixing cases. Yet, um, I've, I've been looking at, I still haven't published anything on this, but I've been looking at the Sotheby's Christie's price fixing conspiracy in auction houses in New York and London and elsewhere, uh, where one of the members, uh, one of the, ch uh, the chairman of one of the companies actually went to prison for, uh, for conspiracy to fix buyers and sellers commission premiums. Uh, once the conspiracy was unearthed, I forget the date now. Um, 1998 or so. Sorry? 
somewhere in the late 90s. Yeah, yeah and I, the, uh, looking at the, at the evidence from only one of them who's, who publishes their numbers, Sotheby's, there's been almost no change in the share of commission revenues and total revenues uh, as a result of the breaking of the cartel. The, uh, the, the uh, commission revenues are running maybe 17.2 to 17.4 percent of um, of total revenues uh, since the cartel was broken during the period of the conspiracy of running about 17.9 percent. Now there's a lot more going on uh, that one has to tease out econometrically. Whatever the effect it was, it was very small. Now to go to the AT&T case, I've just got a couple of charts up here. Um, the argument that I've always made about, in, in retrospect, we couldn't know it at the time, was that we really, the AT&T decree worked because of the equal access provisions. Now, we talked about this somewhat yesterday, and Bruce Owen always gets mad at me when I say, well, you know, all you had to do was impose equal access, and you, could, you didn't have to break up AT&T. He said, well, that's easy for you to say, but at the time it was very hard to know that, and it was very hard to know how you were going to do it, and Joe Weber told us that doing it was not that, was not that easy. But if you look at what happened subsequently in every other country, which emulated us in, in requiring equal access, for entrance, uh, whether they had network facilities or not, uh, um, uh, but those who had uh, switches would get equal access to customers. You can see that on this chart, um, you, you can see the, the, the lower black line, I can't even tell the color there from here, um, the, 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 the one with little diamonds in it, is the progress of U.S. long distance rates in, in terms of cents per minute over a very long period of time. And they surely declined after 1984 and have declined substantially since then. But there are two other examples in there of countries that didn't break up their telephone comp uh, companies, uh, Canada and then uh, all of the European Union countries. And you see there, they get the same pattern but a much more accelerated pattern by just initiating equal access and opening up um, both facilities-based and non-facilities resale competition. They got a similar pattern, even a more, a more rapid decline in, in, uh, in long distance rates. Now at the time we broke up AT&T, we already had solved the, uh, the terminal equipment issue pretty much because the uh, North Carolina case was what, 1977, right? Uh, so e there was already equal access for terminal equipment, so the effects of this decree have to be uh, measured in terms of what happened in the so-called inter-exchange market. Uh, it's still not, um, uh, you, I, I can't prove that the, the, the structural separation didn't add to competition in addition to the equal access because there's all this issue of, of favoritism even if they had equal access at the time. But I think it's rather clear that uh, the actual breakup uh, got you relatively little compared to uh, the equal access provisions. Now, what did the decree? What did the decree cost? Well, that's I was asking Joe Weber yesterday. Um, when you went through the actual breakup, how much output did we lose? When I looked at TFP over a period, long period of time, what I noticed was a significant deviation from trend around 84, 85, uh, and I estimated that to be about three billion dollars a year. That is, holding capital and holding labor constant, output fell in the telecommunications sector by about $3 billion a year. So the, my, my ass, assertion is that that suggests that the breakup, the actual going through the breakup cost about $6 billion. Joe points out to me that there was a lot of un, uh, investment that had to, had to take place that would not have taken place but for the breakup, but I'm holding the capital stock constant, so it may have been more than that. Subsequent to that, we had that entire process before Judge Green, which people have estimated to just the procedures to have cost more than a billion dollars. And then we had the 96 Act, which surely would not have, never have passed but for the AT&T decree. That is, wouldn't it? Sorry? That cost the trillion. I don't know what that cost, but, uh, but what, what we know is that the CLEX who failed reported that, uh, that they spent as much as $65 billion on capital assets, and no one knows where those assets went. Some of them were acquired by other companies. Maybe some were resold on eBay, but a large share of that investment, which may have been capitalized marketing expense, I don't know, the, given the accounting standards of the time. Uh, but there was a huge amount of money wasted in futile attempts to compete because we started the unbundling regime in 1996 is the second country ever to do it after Hong Kong uh, and, uh, and had no idea where it was going and tried to do it in a, an era of, of voice uh, low speed data telephony not in an era of broadband in which other countries are now emulating us
uh, and having much greater success because the entrants have something new to sell. Now, um, having said that, then the question is, have we learned anything from the AT&T decree as we go to Microsoft? Well, in Microsoft, of course, the, the appellate court found that the lower court had not established sufficient uh, uh, evidence for uh, liability and the monopolization charge to warrant the structural uh, uh, breakup between um, uh, the operating system and the applications for Microsoft, and they remanded it back for hearings and for a further uh, decision on what the decree should look like. Remember that, that that hearing I was supposed to participate in on the Microsoft decree never took place because uh, Judge Jackson opined that the government had won the case, they get to call the decree. I'm glad he, I wouldn't want him uh, uh, presiding at a murder trial, but uh, uh, that, that was his opinion, and of course his, his, his opinion was thrown out, he was removed from the case. Now, I don't know that much about Microsoft, and certainly Dan Rubenfeld worked on it, he knows a lot more, and maybe Phil Weiser uh, knows quite a bit about it, but what I'm going to do is just th throw up some numbers to show you what has happened since then. This is what's happened to Microsoft's revenues. I don't, I don't know if you can see it in the back. The two lines, vertical lines, are when the, 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 the uh, last case was brought and when it was settled. And this is a logarithmic scale. So what it shows is there's been some slowing of Microsoft's revenue growth. You can't get it broken out by client and server and all that over a long period of time. So I could, this is their aggregate revenue growth. You clearly see there there has been no dramatic break uh, caused by the antitrust decree. Uh, Given that this was a case not just between the government and Microsoft, but between Sun and Microsoft, who was, uh, Dan could tell you, was in uh, lobbying very hard for the case uh, throughout the period and is still lobbying hard for a continuation of the decree in, in the United States and in, in Europe. Here you see what happened, the red line is what happened to Sun's revenues. Uh, the idea was that if, if uh, restrictions were removed uh, on the Microsoft, uh, in the Microsoft operating system, more people would use Java and, and, uh, and some would profit from it. Well, in fact, they are using more of Sun's Java, but it doesn't look like Sun's had much success in growing their revenues uh, from it. This is what comparing Microsoft's revenues to Cisco's revenues. Why put Cisco up there? Well, what I would like is some measure of what was happening overall to the computer sector. Uh, this is, of course, the uh, um, Cisco is one of the major players and uh, um, in the in the internet uh, um, uh, router market, and they weren't subject to an antitrust decree. You can see that they peak a little bit more in the high tech bubble and fall off more in 2000, 2001 and then start to grow a little bit more rapidly than Microsoft. So maybe Microsoft's growing less rapidly than the market in general. But well, well you can look, yeah, no, I, I agree. But if, if it we're going to lose major market share or have price suppression, unless you, unless you think the price elasticity of demand is rather high, you'd expect some break in their revenue growth. It's true. You could also look at their, huh? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know, but it's, uh, I agree, I agree. But, uh, but um, you could also look at, you, you could do the same thing with market cap and you're not going to get a, you're not going to get a substantial break in market cap. I could have done it with market cap. And, and, and it shows a more dramatic difference between Sun and Microsoft when you do market cap. And then um, finally, uh, if you want to look at what's happening to, to, to Microsoft revenues against PC shipments, now one's in nominal dollars, the other is in units, and this is global PC shipments. Uh, in nominal dollars versus PC shipments, Microsoft is growing at about the same rate in, in real dollars, deflating just by uh, uh, the consumer price index or, you, or the GDP deflator. You get the the result that Microsoft is growing in real terms somewhat more slowly than the, than the uh, computer market. Now finally, <clears throat> um, in trying to prepare for this, I wanted to see what, what had happened to some of the individual markets that, that, that were involved in the uh, 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 Microsoft case, particularly some of the uh, uh, middleware markets. And it turns out uh, the only thing I could find was something that Microsoft submitted. It's a study by uh, Marky and Sinti of uh, Harvard Business School uh, in the proceeding uh, to terminate, to, to extend the decree more than its five years. And what he shows is that um, uh, Microsoft's share of the browser market has indeed fallen. It's fallen from 96.6 to 84.7% between 2002 and 2007. 
Um, <clears throat> all, all of this is an increase due to Firefox. Firefox is more than that decline because Netscape declined over that period. And Firefox, he found, is not being installed on uh, original equipment. It's rather being downloaded through Internet Explorer. Could, could Firefox have been downloaded by Internet Explorer without the decree? Um, that's a question I don't know, but b yes. before the decree. Before the decree, someone pointed out, uh, before the, uh, the case was brought, we didn't have much broadband, so it would have been a much slower download. Um, as far as Java goes, there's no doubt that essentially what Microsoft did, did was to abandon its Java virtual machine, and Microsoft has taken over virtually that whole market. Today, um, <coughs> uh, Sun, I mean, um, Sun has taken over that market. Sun has more than 90% of all uh, JVM installations on, 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 uh, on PCs. As for media players, which is a much bigger issue in Europe than here, uh, my, uh, media player for um, um, for Windows Media Player for Microsoft has remained at the 50% market share since 2003. Real Player has lost market share, and surprise, surprise, um, uh, Apple has picked up all this market share because of obviously because of iTunes. Um, and then the other the other issue is has have these changes led to more downloads of or use of of, uh, of uh, internet applications, applications on the internet as opposed to on the desktop. And there seems to be a, a substantial, uh, at least a beginning of growth in that area. Whether it's due to the decree or not, we don't know, but this was after all at the center of the decree, which was to eliminate the applications barrier to entry. And finally, we're seeing people going to the internet to download applications which compete with the office suite that Microsoft has. So I think you can, it's possible after five or six years to see some erosion in some of Microsoft's market shares. Whether it is due at all to the decree is something I sure can't tell from my, my uh, two or three hours of preparation for this, for this proceeding. But uh, it'll be interesting to see if other people can tease out of the data some impact of, uh, of, uh, of the decree. It seems to me that at the very least uh, we need to have uh, information on how these things work out before we decide we want to keep going down this path again and again and again. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Dan? Well, I had a 10-minute talk, but I think I, I'd like another 10 minutes to respond to Bob, so can I, <laughs> which is not my planned talk, but I'll, I'll <laughs> leave a few comments at the end. Uh, just, just for background, my, my comments reflect my own views, but they are heavily influenced by the fact that I was at the Antitrust Division in 1997, 1998, and 1999. Um, and I realized I have one other thing going for me I hadn't realized before. I actually uh, spent uh, two hours with David Stockman trying to get, David was trying to negotiate a consent degree with me so he could get a merger through, and that was a, quite an experience. Um, he talked just about as fast as Richard, actually. Uh, Wise man. <laughs> Is he in jail now? <laughs> Wise Alec. <laughs> Anyway, I, I wanted to, uh, to, uh, to do two things with my time. One is just to talk uh, broadly about uh, my view about, uh, about consent decrees, which is really all about remedies and talking about what I think about different types of remedies. Uh, and then I would like to, uh, to try to put the Microsoft case in, in perspective. And then at the end, if we have time, respond a bit to what, uh, to what Bob said. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, if, I think most of you know all this, but it is, it's pretty significant, I think. Uh, the Department of Justice is all, has operated f uh, for a long time un under the Tunney Act, uh, and so the DOJ has a very set of specific uh, policy guides uh, uh, that uh, surround uh, remedies, uh, and it, of course, has to, under the Tunney Act, has to make its proposed remedies public and have hearings. The FTC doesn't <laughs> isn't, isn't covered by the Tunney Act, but uh, tries to sort of mimic it in many ways. Uh, the, the set of uh, proposed uh, guidelines that DOJ follows under the Antitrust Division Policy Guide to Merger Remedies uh, really emphasizes the uh, advantages of conduct, sorry, of structural remedies rather than conduct remedies. 
the FCC, as most of you know better than I do, uh, doesn't, also doesn't operate under the Tunney Act, and the FCC, unlike uh, either DOJ or FTC, at least has a history of uh, imposing uh, conduct remedies. Uh, so there's a distinct uh, difference there. Uh, I was just looking uh, more most recently at, at AT&T Bell South, where uh, the FTC, FCC imposed some price caps. Uh, now let me talk, uh, I want to talk about why I like structural rather than conduct remedies, if we're going to have remedies at, at all, um, and why I don't like price caps generally. And most of these arguments, I'll go through them quickly, are ones most of us are familiar with. Um, Structural remedies have the advantage that uh, once you impose them, uh, it's uh, the imposition, it, it may be painful, but the pain is fairly short, and once the remedy is in place, uh, whatever market that is out there is going to be able to operate. So it's going to be a, the, the, at least the immediate cost of transition are likely to be relatively short. And there will, you will not have the lingering effects of having uh, the government trying to uh, trying to manage uh, to uh, regulate a market, and in high tech particularly, uh, I'm actually, I, uh, I think like many people think that the government is not likely to be a very effective institution uh, uh, for regulating. Uh, conduct remedies, on the other hand, involve substantial regulation. There are direct monitoring costs. Um, I've been watching the, the uh, consent decree that was put in place uh, by that for the current administration, not uh, the administration I was working for, and it's very clear that they're having a lot of trouble monitoring uh, what Microsoft is doing. Uh, there are indirect costs uh, associated with the efforts to avoid the letter of, de of the decree. If it's a if the decree involves false price caps, we have the usual problems of measuring price, of com people competing on other dimensions that, like quality, uh, so it's pretty hard to, uh, to monitor price caps. Uh, and you have the risk uh, that in the process of imposing these uh, conduct remedies that you're actually going to restrain pro-competitive activity and particularly innovation. Uh, and finally, you have the, the problem that if, these, uh, if the decree is imposed for any significant length of time, it could limit the firm's ability to, to respond to changing market conditions. So actually, uh, uh, even though, as you'll find out in a minute, I'm very hawkish on certain structural remedies. I'm very negative on most conduct remedies. I think they, the costs are potentially very high and the benefits uh, relatively low. And I think if you are going to impose conduct remedies, you really ought to limit them. And DOJ is, and the FTC both have come around to that view, or maybe they've held it for a long period of time. Uh, remedies that go beyond five, certainly ten years, I think, uh, on conduct are, are dangerous. Um, now, let me just mention quickly why I don't like price cap remedies, uh, and, and I stress this because I happen to still see them. I not only see them at the FCC, but, uh, but many states, as you know, are fairly active in antitrust enforcement, and the states, uh, the states seem to love price cap remedies because they give immediate they appear to give immediate re relief to consumers, and so they have certain political advantages. Uh, and uh, usually, uh, usually those are big mistakes in my view, uh, particularly when the price cap remedy is imposed on a single firm that may have violated the antitrust law. So what you're basically doing is telling one firm you can't compete on price, uh, and maybe price of quality is a combination. Uh, and uh, I've seen cases myself where the net effect of price cap regulations is actually to lead to higher prices as the non-regulated non or non-price cap firms come in and say we have an advantage to beat up on the guy that violated the antitrust laws. We're going to offer a higher quality, higher price product. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I, I, would, I wish we would see uh, 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 f many fewer conduct remedies. Um, I do, I do notice that those of you that don't like these kinds of remedies, I, I do notice from my experience that some consent decrees and remedies uh, have no bite at all, so Bob wouldn't have to worry about them. And I'll just mention quickly uh, one that you might be interested in, because I think most people were not aware of it. Uh, we investigated, when I was in, in, at the Justice Department, we investigated one of the early spectrum auctions, and we found uh, that uh, uh, the some of the uh, Auction theorists who had helped design the uh, auctions apparently had also were very good at ha helping to design uh, ways to rig the auctions. And 
and we found, uh, we found clear, I thought, sophisticated evidence of a signaling device that at least two firms were involved in generating to tell each other uh, how to divide markets. And uh, I still remember this vividly. I shouldn't, I can't reveal all the details, but I remember, uh, remember being pleased to see that none, none of the firms involved uh, denied that they had done what they had done because there is no possible other explanation. But we also had no real evidence that uh, there had been any harm since it's pretty hard to imagine to, to prove what the auction would have looked like but for these uh, signaling devices. So we imposed a consent decree. And if you read the consent decree, basically it says, uh, it says the parties will never do this again, and that's it. And, of course, the parties were never going to do it again anyway, so the remedy uh, probably had no bite, but at least it counted as a victory. And I, I, I have to confess that, in general, from the point of view of the agencies, uh, consent decrees do count typically as victories, at least when you're talking to the Hills. So there, so there is on the margin an incentive to... Uh, to perhaps misuse these consent decrees. Of course, never happened when I was there, but, <laughs> uh, but it may have happened other, other times. Now, uh, with that background, I want to talk a little about, uh, about the Microsoft case uh, uh, and give you a little history, some of which you may not have, have heard about before. Uh, first of all, if, if for those of you who are old timers, remember uh, the, well, I think what well, is now counted as Microsoft One uh, was brought when Ann Bingaman was running the antitrust division. And uh, that case involved, among other things, a look at uh, Microsoft's uh, uh, licensing that involved a processor license on all operating systems, whether or not they were, uh, they were Microsoft operating systems. And after uh, a lot of push and shove, there was a consent decree reached. Uh, and uh, the consent decree actually was originally uh, signed, and, and, and tiny hearings were held by Judge Sporkin, who you know for, for other reasons. But uh, that consent decree uh, ran into trouble with the D.C. Circuit, and when the case was, was eventually remanded, it was actually remanded to a little-known judge at the time whose name was Penfield Jackson. Uh, so Judge Jackson actually handled the original Microsoft One consent decree, and that's significant for those of you who followed our case because when uh, when uh, we uh, brought what the case that's called now I guess Microsoft Two in 1998, it was natural for the court to ask Judge Jackson to take on that case because he already had exper expertise, uh, and. Uh, so during, prior to 1998, the, just for background, the DOJ had sued Microsoft for violating the consent decree. One of the other things that results from consent decrees is it provides an opportunity to uh, create what may or may not be beneficial litigation. The, the litigation over Microsoft One, uh, the violation of the consent decree, was probably unimportant historically, but very significant actually in terms of, of process because it's sort of... Uh, Again, I can't reveal the internal details, but it, it kept the, uh, let's say, the process of, investigation, of investigating Microsoft moving along in the direction that I think ultimately was fruitful, even though DOJ lost its, uh, its uh, on appeal to the D.C. Circuit, lost its claim uh, that Microsoft had violated uh, its original agreement. The agree agreement uh, that was the first consent decree, consent decree involved, among other things, a restriction on tying, so the appeal... Uh, the, the case that was brought by justice had to do with tying. Uh, later, about uh, somewhat less than a year later, Microsoft, uh, sorry, the government brought the, the big, what, what we call the big case, uh, which was really uh, all about monopoly maintenance. The, the key to the case was the argument that I think you all know that Microsoft had, had used its uh, uh, tying in various forms uh, of the browser to the operating system to, uh, to maintain its monopoly in the operating system. And uh, a couple points about that. First of all, uh, there's no doubt in my mind, and no, certainly no doubt in Judge Jackson's mind, that uh, Microsoft feared Sun and feared Java. There was doubt in my mind, I'd say, as to whether Sun and Java would ultimately be successful but the burden, uh, in my view, and the court's view, should not be on, on, uh, on the government. The burden should be uh, if, some, if a firm is engaged in improper anti-competitive activity, it doesn't, uh, the government should not have the burden to prove that there's a 100% probability that, that the competitors will be successful. Uh, 
So I think it's I think it's quite possible that uh, that Java would never have been as successful as as Microsoft feared. But there's no doubt in my mind, uh, from having read the record, that Microsoft thought th thought they would take over. Uh, uh, we could talk a lot about Java's problems, but uh, I think Sun's downturn has uh, has little to do with the consent decree either way. It does have to do with some of some of Sun's internal problems and some of the problems with Java. Uh, in it, wrap, wrap it up. Okay. In any case, uh, Jackson talked to the press. The case gets remanded. Uh, Jackson gets kicked off the case. The uh, the DC Cir the, uh, uh, the Clinton administration is out of power. A remedy gets put in place by Judge Kohler Cotelli. The remedy is entirely a uh, conduct remedy, and in my view, the conduct remedy has almost no bite whatsoever. If it has any bite, it slows down Microsoft because it just hassles them and imposes costs. But uh, the fact that there was no effect on, on Microsoft says something about the fact that there was a weak remedy. Uh, if I had uh, had my choice, I would have imposed the remedy the Justice Department proposed, which was to break Microsoft in two. And I think that despite the discussion we heard yesterday, that the costs of doing so were relatively low and the potential advantages in terms of increased innovation are very high. I recommend very highly that some of you are interested to read Paul Romer's uh, testimony. We'd spent a year preparing uh, to testify at hearing. Uh, we should have had a hearing early on. Paul would have been the lead witness, in my view, and he has a great uh, great statement about the advantages of the innovation that would have been created had there been uh, a second firm in the market. This is to be testimony in the remedy phase? On the remedy phase. So we had a plan to have a remedy phase. We made a mistake. We accepted Judge Jackson's desire not to have one, but uh, that was a mistake. We should have had it. We had spent a year preparing. We had a whole line of witnesses, and it would have been, uh, it would have been a good idea to have it. And Paul would have been the lead witness in that case. And his testimony is out there. It's still worth reading. So I, I've run out of time, but I'll, I'll, I'll just, uh, so I can't respond to all of Bob's um, mischaracterizations of the history of the industry. But I can tell you that if you, if you didn't like the remedies we proposed or, or what happened to the case, I can tell you that there, uh, there are two benefits that uh, the Microsoft, Microsoft case brought. First of all, it led to full employment for economists since, <laughs> since uh, Microsoft has hired up most of my friends that were not involved in the case, uh, including entire universities who are researching uh, for Microsoft. And secondly, it encouraged Bill Gates to increase his charitable giving, which I think has been phenomenal. So, <laughs> so we'll take what we can get. Thank you. Bill? <clears throat> so, um, First, I thank Christopher. This is a wonderful gathering and uh, brings together different kind of generations of scholars on this uh, important case. So thank you so much for doing it, including me. Um, tonight's the first night of Passover and a good Yiddish tradition. I, I'd like to say a few words before I speak. <laughs> <laughs> Although you can count my time for my uh, preface, which um, unlike Dan, I won't make the mistake of waiting until the end to, to respond to my co-panelists. Uh, I'll start off with those points. Um, and the first point to start off with, and Tim Wu adverted to this yesterday, and, and I think that Bob's uh, charts are, are uh, particularly uh, sort of underscoring a weakness of static economic analysis here. And part of the story that Bob doesn't include, and that I think is core to the AT&T story is innovation. And so consider the following. And again, I'm trying to also channel the spirit of Dale Hatfield, who I kind of promised I would represent in spirit a little bit here. Dow Corning invented fiber optic cable in the 1970s. They had a meeting with AT&T, and they said, we would like you to buy this new product from us. It's superior to your microwave long-haul systems. And AT&T's representative said, let me tell you something. We are still depreciating our long-haul network, and we'll continue doing so till the mid to late 1990s. And at that point, we will put in a new long-haul network, which probably will be fiber optic cable, and we won't buy it from you. We'll build it ourselves. And so consider what that does in terms of an innovation marketplace. It destroys incentives and opportunities for innovation because the only person to sell to was the Bell system. The only person the Bell system would buy from 
was Western Electric. And, then, and part of the proof in the case, and this is where I disagree with, uh, again, Bob, about the equipment manufacturing side, was that it was extraordinarily difficult. And Glenn and I had a good discussion on this yesterday. Um, very difficult to get AT&T, even if theoretically they had a different separate subsidiary, they made outside vendors go through hell to try to sell to AT&T. And so, again, the innovation and the quality gains from fiber optic cable, I think, are critical to understanding this case. Could you have gotten those gains through merely conduct remedies? I'm not sure you could, because the challenge was to get the R box to make independent purchasing decisions, which, again, might not have happened unless you went through this exercise of splitting them all up. Was it industrial policy? Absolutely. Now, Bill Baxter had a great exchange. Roger was probably there at the fifth year uh, anniversary. And I think it was, I think uh, Charlotte Brown, the head of AT&T, was kind of bemoaning what had happened and basically said to Baxter one colloquy, you know, why the hell were you so convinced that you needed to break up the whole company? And he said, well, it was a, it was a bet. And uh, Charlie Brown said, well, that's one hell of a bet. Um, but I think he largely, you know, bet right. And I think he had a powerful reason for doing so, which is the conviction, co conviction here that the integrated nature of that company wasn't only or primarily about efficiencies, even though people did like it. It also had these very anti-competitive effects on innovation. And it also, uh, in his mind, poisoned the whole company with regulation. Because Baxter's core conviction was the regulated r rates of the local bells gave this powerful incentive to leverage into these applications, long distance and equipment manufacturing. And Baxter thought you could cut that off, um, you would then have an opportunity for new innovation uh, in the application space. Now, in Microsoft, the hearing didn't happen, so we don't have all the analysis, but I would say I'm much more skeptical there that structural relief uh, would <laughs> be called for. Because I do think there is, you know, a sense of structural relief, it's a pretty major uh, challenge to take, and there's a lot to be said for being a little bit more careful before undertaking it. And in Microsoft, you know, the uh, case hadn't been made. Again, uh, the remedy case stage might have suggested it, although the subsequent remedy discussions, uh, to my mind, and Adam Fowler's close to Stan, didn't quite get there. Um, let me then say a point about why this is so relevant for the future, for the present. Um, and again, Fred Kahn, yes, I said it really nicely. Um, we should be very nervous and concerned in a world of two major providers. Because two major providers, whether in wireless or broadband, um, aren't as likely to welcome that innovation from applications if you have more of them. And uh, in wireless, for example, it took T-Mobile, the fourth player, to say, we'll work with Palm to create a smartphone. And Palm tried really hard to get Verizon, or to get AT&T, then Singular, and AT&T Wireless, uh, to work with them, but they wouldn't. And so they tried this out on one of the more fringe networks. And John Baker has a good paper about um, the nature of this competition, not this case in particular. S same with uh, Virgin's uh, pre-played sort of Virgin uh, Mobile, which is a MVNO. Again, they tried to get the major players to work with them. They wouldn't, and then they got Sprint. And so my point here is that you need to have a broader ecosystem for innovation. And when you start to get in a more concentrated marketplace, there's going to be less experimentation, less innovation. And so that's a core challenge that leads us to, with some sense, see if this will work. Over there? For, for, uh, point it over there, yeah. Um, an inexorable challenge about how these application developers and platform folks live together. And this, is, and this is basically an issue that goes back to the railroads and Standard Oil, um, AT&T, and Microsoft. So, Luke, how am I doing on time now for the actual presentation? Uh, and I'll live with my time. Five about minutes? Eight minutes. Eight left. minutes. All right, all right. Um, so, basically, the point is that if you think about this, you know, from sort of, the, you know, the railroads, if you were, were the, a key platform, and Standard Oil had one of the key applications to bring all throughout the U.S., they had to live with one another. And each of them live in what I will call an existential fear. Um, the platform providers spend a lot of money to build this platform, high fixed costs. Today it's more IP, but in AT&T it was in a lot of equipment in capital cost. And the application developers are both terrified of ex ante restrictions on innovation that they can't get into this world, or after the fact, after they're already in, they've made the innovation, they can essentially be told, all right, guys, thanks for developing this new technology. We'd like to have it now, um, or we'll just cut you off. The AT&T legacy, um, it was a 
culminations has been discussed in this conference of a lot of different antitrust and regulatory oversight efforts. And they um, are described here, starting with the Kingsbury commitment, which started the idea of interconnection. Interconnection as a requirement, uh, in this case it was actually an inverse of what became in the later case, it was the um, local uh, rivals, if you will, the rural independents said, we want access to your long distance network. Um, that was a key form of interconnection that was required. Um, the, the interconnection con uh, concept sort of has remained with us throughout the century since. Uh, the 56 consent decree brings us into the quarantine idea, and interestingly enough, uh, the, we came with it was a de facto compulsory licensing requirement that AT&T did a lot of stuff in data processing, it then went ahead and shared it with others uh, without charge. Um, and then, of course, the modified final judgment, computer inquiry. Microsoft, um, different sorts of um, experiments about what uh, regulations might be put into place. Uh, the breakup, we've talked about the structural relief. Um, I'm not as negative as Dan is about the transparency, disclosure, non-discrimination. Um, we don't totally know um, yet about the effect of it. Uh, I think there's a famous discussion between uh, Henry Kissinger and Mao, where uh, Henry Kissinger says, what do you think of the French Revolution? And Mao says, it's too soon to tell. Um, <laughs> that's probably an overstatement, but I, I do think you know, there's, there's still some room to see what will happen with Microsoft, and I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, and then, of course, the EU has its own decree, which has a separate sort of requirement. Uh, what are the criticisms of this antitrust oversight? Um, I've got four here, um, and it's uh, obviously worth taking all of these seriously. First is Epstein's, and I did have a chance to read your book, Richard, and enjoyed it, and, and surprised you didn't use the concept of the KISS principle, because uh, it didn't seem to apply. For people who are unfamiliar with it, it means keep it simple, stupid. Um, and that was, I think, a lesson that, again, is, is worth uh, for uh, regulators keeping in mind. Um, leaving it to regulators, I thought, was an interesting suggestion that you didn't talk about now, but um, came up in Trinco, and I, and I frankly thought Michael Katz's presentation was perfect on this point. Uh, be careful what you wish for. It's a very interesting move that happens, um, you know, from uh, Scalia, and, and you were suggesting your book as well, too, which is um, the grass is greener, which is, well, these antitrust is consent decrees and antitrust. We should be really careful about them. Um, and then in so doing, we give this pay on to how great regulators are. And again, I, I, loved, I loved Michael Katz says, are they talking to the D.C. Circuit um, on this? Um, probably not. Um, so, again, I think there's some concept of, of you can have a, um, marriage of the two, and I, and I personally think AT&T and Otter Tail were two cases where antitrust and regulation worked very well together, where antitrust set some of the requirements and then left it to the regulator to superintend them. In Otter Tail, it was actually a, a wheeling requirement for wholesale power, where the antitrust court didn't have to oversee it. Instead, it was mandated by the Federal Power Commission. In AT&T, uh, Judge Green did not handle the details of equal access. He was largely able to leave that to the FCC. Um, private ordering, I'll get to that, that in a minute, that's obviously the Easterbrook position, and then technological dynamism uh, as a potential cure. Um, so I think the two challenges are crystallized by the following two perspectives, um, that the problem here is that neither the, the market will solve it or regulators can solve it gives us a totally satisfactory approach uh, in, in looking at this relationship, and that what makes it so challenging in part for the regulators is the tools that regulators have here um, to deal in this context are not necessarily at this point ready to the challenge. Um, and the platform providers have their own sort of challenge here in the sense that um, they do want to try to um, make a commitment to applications that they can ride on their platform, um, but it's not necessarily easy to provide that level of commitment. And, and Jim DeLong's point is here, if you say private ordering, they'll, they'll work together. One challenge here is that uh, it's hard to foresee all the scenarios that can happen. And um, there's going to be, you know, opportunity for mischief of any number of uh, kinds. Um, they are increasingly trying to find ways to provide that level of assurance and invite uh, applications. Uh, Microsoft, by the way, this gets to the room for some optimism. Dan, I'm curious to hear you talk about this. You know, their behavior has showing some more level of we want to make a firmer commitment and, and we'll see how the Windows principles and new oper interoperability principles play out. Um, but those are in some sense of a kind with what's required in the, in the decree. Um, standard setting bodies are, you know, an important role here that um, can play a constructive role. And finally, uh, norms and culture um, as you try to develop uh, a new attitude towards outside innovation. 
Now the problem is sometimes they don't, um, and uh, Joe and I worked on a paper trying to explain some of the exceptions to when um, platform providers will welcome outside applications. Um, the basic rule we called ICE, um, and the exceptions, uh, we have several of them, including the one Joe talked about yesterday, uh, incompetent incumbents. Um, two exceptions actually came up in Microsoft and AT&T. One is Baxter's Law. If you've got a regulated platform, it changes everything. Um, and as Fred Kahn said, the Chicago School had long recognized that as an exception to the nature of uh, vertical dealing. Um, and applications as a competitor to the platform uh, is a very interesting exception that was concerned in the Microsoft case. It's a concern that's come up in broadband as well, in network neutrality. The Madison River case was, in a sense, a part of that. Um, and so I've suggested that the Comcast uh, VU's complaint could also be. Um, why does it matter to society when these application platform relationships are not smooth? Well, it matters for at least two reasons. The first is innovation. I've mentioned this before. Innovation is something that can happen from outside folks trying lots of different things. If the platform provider is, in some sense, hostile to that, that hurts social welfare. Um, and sometimes, if there are just simply strategic games between the two of them trying to appropriate rents, often we can say, you know, who gets the rents doesn't matter to society. Well, except if they are playing this game that leaves society worse off because they're playing a game of chicken um, with one another. Um, so, so, Phil, wrap it up. Wrap it up. Well, I've got, I think I, uh, this is this is my next slide, so that's it. So basically, um, there there are some lessons I would try to take away and put out there, although I think we're really still very much trying to figure out how to solve these challenges. One is restricting integration. I do think you know, uh, the burden is strongly on the um, regulator to try to do that, because there are obviously uh, efficiencies there. Um, some of these norms that have developed over time, I do think uh, serve society reasonably well. And uh, finally, um, some of these institutions that I'm talking about here, standard setting bodies, antitrust-like regulation, self-regulation norms and contractual commitments, and antitrust as a backstop all give us a toolkit to help address this problem, which in some sense is, I think, an enduring one. It's not going away. We've had it since the railroads. We've had it in at and We've had it in Microsoft. Um, it'll take different forms, and we're challenged to try to come up with ways to address it. Thank you. Uh, now I'm going to go through the yeah. panelists in the all same right. order, give them right. each uh, two minutes okay. to, to respond, and then I'm going to open it up for the floor. Oh, okay. Thanks. Um, First of all, I mean, one of the things I wanted to comment on is this dastardly charge that there are no numbers in my books apart from date. <laughs> um, I think that's actually true. And then once you see the numbers on the board, you realize why it's not only true but wise. I mean, the only <laughs> The only kind of numbers that you get tend to be those numbers about overall global performance of large complex companies, only a fraction whose activities are associated with the act, with the particular consent decrees or the points in legal disputes. Um, it's instructive that nobody who actually worked in these cases thought the numbers were particularly important in the way in which they argued them and judged them. Um, this is an area, unfortunately, where the best you can do is to have some kind of general theory and, and see whether or not it tells you what is going to work or what is not going to work. So that's my first point. My, my second point is I, I agree with Phil Weiser with respect to the point about innovation and so forth. And note, of course, if you have a system of forced interconnection, you'll get multiple vendors into the same system. Some of them can buy it. I think, however, there's a point to the story which he did not tell, which is extremely important, which is that one of the reasons why AT&T took its particularly hostile view has to do with the way in which rates are set in these industries. Uh, what typically happens in these cases is the equipment, in fact, appreciates very rapidly relative to new technical innovations, and the regulators wanting to keep the rates low in the early period say, ah, what we'll do now is we'll slow this stuff down, we'll give you slower appreciation in the earlier periods and higher depreciation in the later periods, and what the guy was worried about at AT&T was they were essentially in an arrears account on their depreciation. If they switched technology, what would happen is they would be denied any depreciation, so they would never be able to recover the full cost of their investment. So when you're trying to figure out what's going on in this situation, there's another principle which he did not mention, which I think is absolutely critical in this area, which is never followed, is that whenever you're doing these things, you have to make sure that the books are coherent within each proper period. So if your depreciation in period one is 100, that's what it has to be. You don't want it to be treated as 50 on the books, have 50 carried over. And indeed, in the 1996 decree, it's exactly what happened is 
they managed to impose a system of rules on cross recovery, ignoring historical costs, which meant that the incumbents could never recover their full cost at any point in the cycle. And so it's not just a question of AT&T not being innovative. They are not innovative, in fact, in part because they know that innovation, which is socially beneficial, is under the rate system going to be wrong. And my last comment is with respect to Dan. I don't get what's going to happen out of a structural remedy in this particular case if you break these two companies up. If there's an operating system in one which has monopoly powers in a smaller company, it seems to me to still have the same dangers. Uh, so as far as I'm concerned, a, a remedy in that case, which is easier than an AT&T, is appropriate, which is to sort of mandate the interconnections and make sure they work technically. And the great advantage is in the AT&T case, when you run the interconnections, the real pricing issues that have to be solved whereas for the most part the pricing issues on a zero in the in the Microsoft case nobody even talked about them because everybody kind of assumed that no one's going to charge for anything which in fact is the focal point so I don't think the structural remedy that he wants works and I thought that the you know Doug Ginsburg said it was a pretty good remedy he's one of my former students so I think that everything <laughs> that he says is about right um, so I would I don't think the decree was bad, and I think the, uh, Dan is right that the niggling way of nipping at the heels of the company has made it into less of an agile entity than we want, so that I think the key feature is to make sure that now that it's supposed to be over, let it be over, and, and you know, maybe you won, maybe you lost, but let's go on to the next piece of futile action somewhere else. Uh, well, uh, you did use numbers in your your re rebuttal. You said the number of vendors, so I, I so, uh, uh, that's that hammer. Uh, in, in response to uh, to your notion that I mean, you you certainly can do empirical analysis of the effects of antitrust cases. The fact, in response to to Michael's point, I mean, it's a very good point. I, just throwing the revenue numbers up there doesn't tell you a lot. What I'm trying to do is to provoke people into beginning to look at this. I mean, there's no superficial evidence other than the sorts of things I was. Uh, I was talking about in individual markets that suggests the, uh, the decree has worked. It or has worked very uh, dramatically yet. It may well be uh, that it, ha it is working and people ought to get into the numbers. But uh, unless you get into the numbers and look at what has happened to innovation, what has happened to uh, uh, the, the price of computers, operating systems, applications, new applications, and so forth, I don't see how you can, you can reach a conclusion as to whether something has worked. Now, on the uh, AT&T decree and the installation of fiber optics, uh, that story has been around for a long time. Uh, I think we need more than just waving our hands at that. First of all, um, a lot of the initial fiber optics installation really uh, took place in the inner exchange sector. Um, um, just having the equal access provision would have made that sector a lot more competitive and would have induced the Microsofts, I mean, excuse me, the MCIs and the uh, sprints of this world to, to lay uh, fiber optics to which uh, AT&T would have had to respond. Um, the question of whether breaking up the operating companies within AT&T caused them to become more efficient, I wouldn't be surprised by what it did, but I don't think you use the antitrust laws for that. I mean, it may well be that today breaking up General Motors into separate uh, companies would cause maybe one of those operating divisions to produce something that people wanted. Uh, but but uh, you're not going to use the antitrust laws to do that. That's a competitive market right now, and, and General Motors is successfully managing themselves into the ground. Uh, I'm surprised the stockholders haven't demanded that on their own. So I don't think you, you justify the AT&T case in terms of, well, it, uh, it made the uh, individual operating companies uh, operate more efficiently. Uh, you have to justify it in terms of co competition policy and whether it increased competition. Thank you, Dan. Sure. The, the Microsoft case was really all about innovation. And uh, <clears throat> Paul Romer pointed out in his testimony that <clears throat> innovative efforts by Netscape and some were directly impeded by Microsoft's actions. <clears throat> As a result, applications developers who could have written programs that were complements with the Netscape browser or Java faced reduced incentives to do so. Um, <clears throat> the story that really comes to my mind is one, one party that I won't mention came in to see us at the time and said, uh, we're really worried we have this new innovative device. And by the way, most of the innovations, I said this yesterday to Mike Salinger, a lot, most or many of the innovations in this space were done by very small companies. And this was the CEO of a small company <clears throat> with a new innovation, and he came in to complain about Microsoft. And, uh, and we said, well, what's the complaint? Microsoft isn't in this space yet. 
IBM, all the other big players were producing. Microsoft literally didn't have a product, and he said because they announced last week they were going to bundle our, my, my product with their operating system. There's something wrong when, when a company fears its competitor, someone that hasn't even entered the market yet, simply because they have the power to, to bundle uh, complementary products. <clears throat> uh, and I think that, w <clears throat> that was pretty typical of the problem. Now, why don't we see any evidence in what Bob was showing? A part of it, as I said, is that the actual remedy really didn't have much bite. But, th but the second thing that I think is going on, which really doesn't have to do with our cases, goes back, <clears throat> goes back in my history to, my, to the late 80s when I was Microsoft's expert in the Apple Microsoft copyright infringement case. <clears throat> and at the time when I was in Redmond as a good guy, uh, from Microsoft's point of view, Microsoft was a small horizontal company. They had actually four attorneys at the time. It's hard to believe they now have hundreds. And they were totally horizontal. It was actually a fascinating place to spend time. Gradually, as companies get bigger, they have to become vertical. And my, my view, uh, just as, as a distance, is that it, Microsoft has had trouble adjusting to, to becoming much more vertical. It's, hard, it's harder to create internal incentives to, to create innovation when you have that kind of vertical structure. So I think <clears throat> some of their, uh, uh, the fact that they haven't continued to do quite as well as some expected really it probably doesn't have anything to do with the consent decree. It probably has to do with the fact that they're dealing with the problem of being big. Uh, and maybe 10 or 20 years from now, Google will do the same thing since Google is now horizontal and someday is going to have to become, become vertical. <clears throat> uh, so I wouldn't want to claim that the, uh, the consent decree had much to do either way. I also, by the way, <clears throat> am not thrilled by some of the remedies imposed by Europe, even though I think that, the, uh, that there's a real problem with the uh, real player. There a real problem with the real player. Uh, Real has been hurt badly and probably would have been hurt badly even without uh, the Apple iPod. I guess three quick things. The first is with regulation, one of the benefits in the LD sector is when they got away from regulation into a competitive world, AT&T just wrote off the sort of unappreciated part of the network, which is, you know, again, anathema in the right regulation context. And what, what Baxter had and was his, I think, key motivation for structural relief is get this LD and equipment out of this regulated mindset so they can act like normal companies. So that was part of the rationale there. Um, a, a second point um, with respect to um, innovation in the Bell operating companies, the, the problem, uh, Bob, was that they couldn't purchase switches from anyone other than Lucent. Um, so there was no competitive ecosystem there for a huge part of the industry. And so it wasn't necessarily within how they operated, but the impact into adjacent markets that was also distorted. They were, they were buying switches from Nortel at the, at the, as, as the case was brought. I'll let, I'll let Mike, I'll let Mike, I'll let Mike Altschul uh, have a rebuttal on that one. He worked on that part of the case. So um, Mike can, can take that one. And finally, I guess just for Dan, I, I'm just not as uh, deeply pessimistic about the decree and litigation having no impact on Microsoft's behavior. I don't think they've been bundling the same way after the case. Um, and I do think their commitment to openness, you know, reflects somewhat of a new perspective. I think Richard talks about this in his book with yeah. the new general counsel. So again, oh, big I, difference. Yeah, I, I do think that, you know, um, it, it's not so easy to kind of, it's, it's easy to say when you get structural relief, it's having an impact, but I, I guess I'm not convinced of that. Okay, uh, we're going to open up some uh, questions. One, two, three, probably all. We're going to have to do two short and uh, Okay. Um, so a question mostly or, uh, for Bob, but also for everyone. Uh, I mean, in terms of the Microsoft remedy, uh, I think what's going on is the goal of the remedy was to stop Microsoft doing certain things to squelch the kind of competitive threats that, according to Bill Gates, come along once in a generation. That's a very difficult thing to test. And so your test, even to the extent that it's negative, has extremely low power. That's so correct. We, we need to be very careful not to do a very low-powered test and then announce that, quote, there is no evidence, unquote, that it worked. But, but isn't part of the problem there that whenever you have these sort of A-bomb type situations, because that's clearly what Microsoft is worried about, you have no idea what you're supposed to do, because even if you had the perfect antitrust remedy, um, you're not clear when you don't know what the new technology is, how they're going to circumvent it, or whether or not they're going to be able to uh, have to depend in any sense on Microsoft or not. Um, so yeah. my view about it is you're absolutely right about this, the nature of the dangers. Discontinuous losses of massive proportions is what they clearly fear. 
I do not know how you structure any system to handle that. This is like writing back to the future in 1985 and not seeing the internet in 1988, right? I mean, yeah, I, but, and that's of course why we don't want numbers, right? We, we, mean, we want lawyers to handle these things. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, then it becomes a, a theological debate. <laughs> That's why we're doing on Passover, I guess. So I'm, I'm going to uh, agree with Bob on, on, on behalf of the economists here, uh, but in a roundabout way. So it seems to me that we've, uh, in this day and a half, have been discussing, in a way, three propositions, all of which are pretty well established in, in the economics literature. One is that uh, non-discrimination requirements sometimes can have beneficial effects on investments in downstream industries. I think this is what yeah, Dan was saying. Secondly, uh, non-discrimination requirements work better if they're supported with a structural restriction that creates incentives for cooperation. I think that's an enduring lesson of ATT, the Telecom Act, and, and Microsoft, which is not to say conduct restrictions have no effect. It's just that they work better if their if incentives are in line with those. And the third proposition is that uh, non-discrimination requirements can have harmful effects on innovation incentives in the upstream industry. And so Tim Wu and, and, and Chris Yu can argue about where is innovation most important and they'll continue to do so. But at the end of the day, there's trade-offs between all of these things because structural remedies have their, their direct and indirect costs as well. And so what we really need is to start thinking about how, how to weigh those trade-offs empirically. Uh, there's theoretical work to be done to identify the relevant market conditions in which one might be greater than, than the other, but, but ultimately uh, it's, it's, it needs to be an empirical debate, and it's a very difficult empirical debate because in any particular case you're always weighing what happened against the counterfactual about which you don't have any evidence. Uh, so I think that's where the hard thought needs just, to be. Just briefly, in tying in with what Joe said, um, uh, it seems to me, first of all, that if, if uh, the remedies which were finally imposed on, on Microsoft or to which they consented had been um, uh, dangled before them um, much earlier, they might have settled on that basis. Uh, I, actually, early. they were. They were. Uh, Judge Posner couldn't yeah. talk about the most interesting thing, well, which is his, yeah. his effort to bring that case to a close, and it was the states who uh, reportedly undermined that. And that, that could have happened in 1998. It strikes me that the costs of this decree are far less than the cost of a structural breakup in the AT&T case, for example, and therefore the benefits correspondingly don't have to be nearly as great to offset the cost. But then the, uh, the other issue, it seems to me, is whether the, uh, the opening up of, of network computing through Java and, and competitive browsers, if that was a, a threat to Microsoft in the, in the mid-1990s, it, would it not still be a threat and would it not still work or has the time passed for that? Well, let me just, uh, two things to add to Mike's list. Um, uh, Jerry Fallhaber's point, which is non-discrimination requirements work better for the simple interface. I think it's important to add to that list. The complexity of the, you know, uh, interface makes it more difficult. And then I would add, uh, they work better if they're cultural norms and social pressures that reinforce the commitment to openness. Uh, let me, th this is sort of more generally a question for the panel and, and for the audience. And we've been hearing a lot about innovation in the panel. This is sort of like the talisman. We, we need to have innovation. And, and Schumpeter taught us that's really much more important than these dead weight loss triangles. So I agree with that. But, you know, there's something, and this gets back to the empirical issue. We know something as economists about productivity. We know something about what the right price levels are. We, we know something about this. We also know, as economists, that the correct level of innovation is not infinite. It's something. But we have no idea how to calculate it. We have no measures of it. So what we do is we introduce these little examples, like, you know, there's some two-bit company with a product who wants to try to sell something to Microsoft, and they're discouraged from doing that. That's awful. <laughs> uh, you know, how do you know that? How do we measure that? What's the right level of innovation and where should it be taking place? And we, we sort of, you know, Tim was doing this. We were all doing it yesterday, and we're doing it again today. He said, oh, well, you know, we don't want to discourage innovation. So, How so, do you know what the so right Dan, level is? Dan, do we know what we don't know? <laughs> <laughs> I think we, 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 uh, we know a little more than you're saying, Jerry. I mean, but you're right. There's, uh, there are, um, and if you look at Paul's, some of Paul's writing, uh, 
you'll see a lot more systematic discussion of that. But you're right, we don't have a nice index uh, that makes it so simple. It's just one of those things that's very hard. Okay. By the way, one, one thing, uh, just to dangle for fun, we did ask Bill Gates once, uh, and I'm not going to answer this, what he thought about the breakup, and his answer would be part of a great book that I'll never get to write. So, <laughs> is it in his deposition? Is, is it in public domain? It's not. I don't no, think no. so. <laughs> is it expletive deleted? Buy me a beer sometime and uh, <laughs> see, I'll see whether I can tell you the answer. Okay, let me, let me just go briefly, last word, 30 seconds each of you. Yeah, um, I don't understand innovation either, but, but it seems very clear to me that so long as there's technical improvements out there, no matter what you do, you can't completely destroy it. You will simply change the focal point at which it enters the system. And so that on balance, I think that most of these changes are not going to have huge impacts upon that. Uh, much more important in that world to make sure you don't mess up the patent system, which they're about to do um, in one way or another, and to sort of leave the industrial organization on grounds of simplicity and structure, which you're trying to do. So I like non-discrimination principles in order to enter into networks, and I think on the one great AT and system that we did learn from the 1996 Act is that the uni sales, the four sales systems, was catastrophic relative to everything else, and that that's some experiment, the takings version of this, with just compensation, which we ought not to try again, and better to have duplicated networks growing up out of the weeds and ways to interconnect as opposed to that, and leave innovation to other sectors. Bob. Well, I leave uh, this session profoundly depressed after Jerry's uh, uh, talk. Uh, he tells me that uh, that innovation is the most important uh, um, part of the of the game here, but we can't measure it. So therefore, what do we do? I guess we're just left with uh, uh, we have to leave it to the lawyers, and that's that scares the hell out of me. No, this 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 is a call for further research. Lawyers, and it's okay. <laughs> I just want to tell Bob that I still am convinced after the session that active antitrust important, is important. Uh, Microsoft, during the Microsoft trial, predicted that their browser share would be 30 percent within two years. Uh, their share is now well over 80 uh, um, percent, and uh, no one has no one has uh, succeeded in, t in uh, jumping over leapfrogging Microsoft when it's been successful. They often fail, but when they succeed, uh, no one seems to interfere. That suggests that we ought to just keep our eyes open and watch them carefully. Bill? You know, I think, I think I've got to say, so I, I'll, I'll okay. cede my tie to Roger and all, I guess. Okay. Uh, before, before Roger wraps up this thing, I just want to uh, say, <laughs> say thank, you to, thank you to Christopher for putting this thing together. It's been I, I didn't really intend to be the last word, but I would just wanted to remark that only Bob Crandall and Cliff Winston believe that football players and basketball players didn't get salary increases after their antitrust cases, that there weren't more television, uh, televising of college football games at lower rights fees after the NCAA case, uh, and that most recently, after the settlement of the Jason White case, that which allows now student athletes in colleges to get the same scholarships that non-student athletes can get by eliminating the cap on need-based scholarships for student athletes didn't happen. <laughs> well, uh, panelists, thank you very much. Uh -huh. I'm not even sure that last one. You thought, uh, Roger, you thought the NCAA case was rightly decided, right? What? You thought it was rightly decided. Okay, well, the football.